Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Irenic Ref Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Gross. The word Irenic means aimed at or aiming towards peace. And my goal with this podcast is to try to create a bridge between coaches and officials by showing the humanity of each other in a more robust way, which isn't necessarily achievable in the minimal interactions a coach and official may experience during a game. With all that said, let's get to it. Today's guest grew up in a smaller town in Northeast South Dakota, and he currently lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, so he has had the small town and big city experiences. He walked on in Northern State and played under Coach Paul Sather. He has been coaching for 10 years and will be going into his third year as a head coach. In his 10 years of coaching, he got his first coaching position under Craig Nelson, which lasted for four years and then was the JV girls coach under Jamie Parrish the remaining three years until acquiring his head coaching position as the boys varsity head coach. In his two years as a head coach, he took both of his teams to the state tournament with a third place finish two years ago and an eighth place finish this last season. He has a 65% winning percentage, 31 wins as a head coach, and was also featured on a podcast called Championship Vision. Uh, please welcome Jeff Tobin. Jeff, uh, thanks for coming on this evening. Andrew, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just want to talk about this. You you were on a podcast called Championship Vision. Um, people can check that out. I think, was it two years ago, like right as you got your head coaching position? Is that correct? It was, yeah. So that was um, kind of a, a random interaction that happened. I follow a lot of coaches on Twitter. And um, this um, Coach Furtado that um, coaches girls basketball, he he has this this podcast that you mentioned. And um, I followed him on Twitter and I actually just, he posted something about, um, you know, kind of building a framework framework for your program. And he posted that, you know, if you want to, you know, get any more information, he'd be happy to share it with you. So I just emailed out to him and, and he shared the rest of that information with me. And then he asked if I would be interested in being a, a guest on his podcast. And obviously at that point I told him, well, you know, I've been an assistant coach. I I haven't technically been a head coach yet, but I'd love to, you know, share my, my perspective and, and, um, you know, a lot of coaches that have been coaching for 30 plus years, they, they always mention how things change when you move just one seat down on the coaching, um, on the bench. So I was kind of in that position right there where I was shifting gears to now figuring out, all right, going into fall, how does this all feel differently now that I am, you know, the, the head coach of a team. So it was a really interesting podcast and, and I'm happy I did it, and it was uh, it was very informational for both of us. Yeah, for sure. And um, for those of you that don't know, Championship Vision, uh, I think it's two was it two fifty seven somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly. It's a lot, it was a lot of a lot of episodes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so somewhere in there, two fifty seven. If you just Google it, you'll be able to find it. Uh, Championship Vision, uh, Coach Jeff Tobin. Uh, but along with that, um, I did end up finding out through a bunch of googling that you, in fact, started your own podcast. It is called was called the warrior way tell me more about um tell me more about that like the vision behind that what how that all came about uh yeah just just go ahead and tell us about that so yeah that that actually it's 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 a funny story that idea came about on a walk that my wife and i took during covid when every, all anybody could do for exercise was basically go out and walk and at that time our little girl was just a couple months old and i remember being on that walk and um, I, I just was like, you know, I, we were, everybody in their, in their grandma was, li were listening to podcasts at that time too. It was like all the rave. And so I was like, you know what? I kind of like to start a podcast. And so I was thinking through ideas and actually, I remember calling coach Craig Nelson at the time. And I was like, do we have any, any podcasts where I, I just thought it'd be cool to talk about like South Dakota sports, you know, like talk, bring a bunch of different legends on or bring a bunch of different iconic names on and just, you know, pick their brains. And, and since then, I, I think Craig Maddock has kind of made that idea come to fruition with his podcast where he has a bunch of South Dakota legends come on. Uh, so I, I had that idea and then I kind of threw around the idea of, you know, what if we at Sioux Falls, Washington, I, I just had a vision of um, bringing notable current and past names on the podcast to give their perspective and their time 
um, at Washington High School because our, our school has so much rich tradition going back to when it was the only school in Sioux Falls. And and a lot of the, the successes that we've had, not only in sports, but in other areas um, within our school community. And, and so I just said, you know, it, right now in the time that we were in during COVID where everybody was um, hesitant and seemed like they were so distant and broken apart, I thought it'd just be a good way to kind of stir up a little spirit within our school of bringing togetherness back. Uh, even though we had to, when we started the podcast, there were so many rules about we're in a little confined room. We had to sit, you know, this far away. We had to wear masks. So like you're going through, like I had to make sure that our, our audio wasn't muffled because of these masks. And, <laughs> and so there were just a whole lot of different, different things going on at the time while I'm trying to figure out how to also do a podcast. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really cool experience because I got to connect to a lot of names that I had heard throughout my first at that time seven years at Washington. But then I finally got to sit across the table from them and and pick their brains and hear stories and meet them. Um, you know, one of my favorite my favorite um, podcast interviews I did was with Coach John Odney, who was a, a, a head coach back um, in the '80s, and he had a perfect season with our men's basketball team in 1984 um and won a state championship and just one of the nicest guys that I've ever met and and, and I'm, I wouldn't have gotten to meet him otherwise um and wouldn't have had that relationship and and he just passed away last year but now like with that podcast our goal was to tell warrior stories and make voices last that was kind of our motto and mm -hmm. um we have another teacher at Washington who uh was was in his 40s I believe and he was a science teacher and he got diagnosed with stage four cancer and and right before um, he ended up passing just months before we were able to get him on the podcast and and have him tell about his experience at Washington. So now, you know, the thought behind this, his family and his school community has his voice on a podcast for for as long as we have, you know, the, the audio around. And so that was kind of the idea. And, and then once head coaching got going for me, just time time wears thin and he, I always wanted to do a good job at whatever I was doing. And unfortunately I just couldn't put the time in that was needed to do a good podcast. Just like you were saying, once basketball yeah. gets rolling, the time isn't there. So, um, you know, kind of put the brakes on it, but it was a really, really fun experience um, for sure. Yeah. And um, you mentioned a few of them that were really cool. Was there any other ones that you just, you, you were like, man, I'm, I was really glad that I had that interview and that opportunity. Yeah. So another one, uh, former coach, Jim Trett, yeah. Um, he came on the podcast and he he's just a, a storyteller. Um, he's a Northeast South Dakota guy, too. He actually grew up in North Dakota um, in, in Valley City. But uh, he um, man, he could tell a story and, and he told a lot of them, not only of his time at Washington, but coaching up in Northwestern and some of the old uh, Class B stories. So he was he was a great one. And then, you know, we had a couple of, of students come on. Uh, Randolph Kapai, he was one of our first interviews when he was homecoming king. He now plays football down at Nebraska. Um, those are a couple notable ones that stand out to me. And it, it just, um, it, it was great because we had, you know, we had former students. We had a few current students at the time. We had former coaches. We had, um, we had a couple teachers get recognized. We had administration. Um, Coach Parrish came on a podcast yeah. too. So just really fun to get to kind of pick the brains of a bunch of different people in different areas. Yeah. And, and if I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Parrish, Coach Parrish was on the championship vision as well. So he yeah. was. Anyway, yeah. side note, but yeah, you yep. guys can check that out as well if you want to see and two of them back to back. You can watch Jeff's on there and then you can watch uh, Jamie's as well. Um but yeah, let's get into more of the the coaching questions here now. Um or, or just personal stuff to start with. So tell me more about yourself, where you grew up. I know you grew up in, in Northeast and in Langford. Uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit more about that, your upbringing, everything like that, and then your family currently and any hobbies you have. Yeah, so like you said, I mean, I grew up in a community of, you know, between two, 300 people. So really small class B school, but at the time it seems normal. You know, it seems big in, in, in some ways. And when I tell my students, at the beginning of the year, you know, where I come from and I tell them the amount of people I had in my class and the things that we didn't have in our town that they do have in Sioux Falls, they can't understand how we even lived. Like they can't understand how you didn't have a mall to go to or yeah. you had to drive 45 minutes to the nearest Walmart. It just doesn't make sense. And so luckily I have that perspective now, um, you know, being from, from Langford and, and uh, you know, from, 
the time I was there um, to the time I graduated college, I was lucky to gain a lot of perspective. I went to SDSU for two years right out right out uh, um, as I graduated from Langford. And then when I decided on education, I decided I wanted to transfer up to Northern and finish out my degree in special education. And so I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to walk on uh, when I went up there and, and play for the men's basketball team. And, and while I was there too, always had in my mind that I wanted to become a coach uh, and do that side of things along with teaching, but didn't know that it would take this route to becoming um, a head coach necessarily. And so I was always, when I was part of the men's basketball team in Northern, I was always kind of looking at things through a, through a coaching perspective, trying to learn, trying to grow, trying to better understand. And so when I graduated from Northern, I got my first teaching job down here at Sioux Falls, Washington in the special education department. And was lucky enough that at the time, um, Jamie Parrish had just moved off of the boys' staff to take the head coaching job for the girls' um, position that Nate Malchow had just stepped down from and became the AD. And so uh, Craig Nelson had a volunteer position open on his staff. So uh, right off the bat, I took that and was a volunteer assistant for him for four years. And um, I I always say that I give every um, – every bit of gratitude and thanks to him for this opportunity that I have, because he was really the one that made me believe that I was going to be a head coach. I didn't think it for myself at the time, but he spoke it to me often and made me believe it and, and gave me a lot of um, opportunity and a lot of responsibility that most volunteer coaches don't get. And so um, I took those and I ran with them. I worked extremely hard. I tried to prove that I was worth something. You know, I hmm. tried to build really good relationships with our players and our guys and make myself, um, you know, make the program benefit because I was part of it. And and so because of that, four years um, in, there was an opportunity on Coach Parrish's staff and he came up to me and said, hey, um, I have this this opportunity open. Would you be interested and so when he said it, I, you know, I was hesitant because I loved the the staff that I was working in at the time. I loved what I was doing. But at the same time, I knew that I maybe wanted to go toward an opportunity to become a head coach. So it was, um, you know, to be a JV coach was a step in the right direction. So I, I took the um, opportunity on the girls staff and was really fortunate because I got, um, you know, one one coaching perspective from Coach Nelson and then going to Coach Parrish. It's a different coaching philosophy. So I um, I got both sides that I really benefited from, and then uh, we were blessed to have a couple of really good teams, too, and win a state championship in 2020, 2021. Um, so I was really lucky in that in that facet, too. And, and then, uh, you know, Coach Nelson decided to take his um, – take the head coaching job at Brandon Valley. Uh, I was um, just in awe that I was – able to become the head coach of Sioux Falls, Washington. And ever since then, I, I tell my wife all the time, like I get to go to Sioux Falls, Washington, and I get to teach PE and wear sweatpants and teach, you know, teach uh, dodgeball, basketball, whatever we're doing for the day and coach basketball. It's, it's a dream. So I'm really, really fortunate. Yeah. Um, I, I actually was pursuing uh, physical education back in the day and just, it just wasn't for me. And so I kudos to people who, can do that and enjoy doing that. Um, I don't think I wouldn't, I would have not enjoyed it, but it just wasn't the right fit for me. So, but kudos to you and other teachers that, uh, yeah, put in the time and effort to really pour into students and especially as a coach, pour into student athletes as well. Um, any hobbies that you have that you, I know I talked to uh, Coach Reck and he said that you, you two went golfing quite a bit this summer. Is there any other hobbies besides the golfing? Well, I mean, for Coach Reck to say that we were golfing, um, you know, a decent amount this summer. It was a lot. I mean, we went, <laughs> we went almost every day and, and yeah, golf right now is, is I love, I love golfing. Uh, we love golfing. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's, that's the biggest hobby. And and right now, honestly, having, we've got two, two young girls, a four year old and a going to be two year old in the house that, I mean, our hobbies right now are keeping up with them, try, you know, trying to, there's a lot of fights being picked right now between little and big sisters. So trying to break those up. Um, but you know, it, it's a, it's a lot of fun just around the house, just doing just these, these random things that you end up doing, whether it's coloring or playing soccer in the backyard, or she wants to go out and ride her bicycle. I mean, it's just a hobby in itself being a dad right now. So I uh, really enjoy that. And then 
Um, I would say uh, just exercise in general. You know, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with being a PE teacher, but I just love, you know, anything active, whether it's just getting a workout in, whether it's going on a run, whether it's, you know, biking or, or golfing or anything. Um, I, I, my wife and I, she played soccer in college at Northern too. So we love to just get outside and be active and, and do whatever comes with getting our heart rates elevated. So that's, that's kind of what you'll find us doing. Yeah. And I, and I can relate obviously with kids that it seems like another hobby is just cleaning things up. It seems to be another hobby with, with the younger kids. I told my wife, I, I came downstairs to, to grab a, um, you know, one little girl, one of our, our oldest girl had this little mini chair she was sitting in. So a little baby sister wanted one. So I had to come downstairs to get it. And then in, in pursuit of that chair, I stepped on a little toy cupcake and all the pain. It just, I came upstairs and I told my wife, like, I think I'm going to bruise from this. It, people forget, I mean, the Legos and the, the, the plastic toys. Oh my goodness. It, it's, it's a, a battle zone sometimes. Yeah. Can, can completely relate to that. Um, yeah. yeah. So next question, you, you kind of talked about people like that were in your path, um, you know, coach, uh, Nelson, Coach Parrish, even uh, Sather up at Northern. Um, tell tell us more about the influences they had on your coaching and, and what you took away from them individually. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll start with Coach Sather. I think the thing with him um, that I really appreciated and still appreciate is his his straightforward and honest approach and obviously in college it's a little different like you're you're there because you know you a lot of people get scholarships to come play and it's just different than high school but um you know I love the fact with him that there was an intensity about him and there was a um you know a drive every day to to improve and be our best and I think that came from just the way that Northern State men's basketball especially at the time being after coach Don Meyer um you know had, had just coached there and and um, brought such a tenacity to that program. I was lucky to be part of that tradition. And then I think that bled into when I first got my opportunity down here with, with Craig, you know, him coming from that same program and playing for coach Meyer, all the, it was just a really good fit because all the terminology and all the, um, all the, the knowingness of how he operates and, and how he expects his program to be run. I, I was all for that. I understood it and it wasn't foreign to me. I, I didn't come in, um, you know, in shock or in, or in awe of maybe at the time him trying to run it like a college program, um, because it was just like, all right, this is how we do things. It's, it's intense. It's honest. It's hardworking. It's, um, you know, it's just, just how we, how we do. And so, um, I really appreciated that. And that made me want to, you know, work even harder for him. And, um, you know, he's a great friend and I look up to him in so many ways that, that, um, um, still to this day, I call him all the time. I'm trying to pick his brain and, and trying to better understand how I can do a better job. And, and that translates to working with coach Parrish too. I mean, we talk every day about, you know, what we're going to do in three weeks when season starts, you know, mm-hmm. there's going to be 70 kids coming in the gym, to try out, what are you going to do? You know, how are we going to, how are we going to best maximize our gym space? Cause right now we don't have a mini gym. We just have a main gym. So what are we going to do? You know? So um, the ability to just be able to problem solve with great minds and great coaches is really a blessing. And then you mentioned Tim Rack and, and that, that staff that I was first part of with uh, Craig Nelson being head coach and Tim Rack being JV and now Mike Holstein, JJ Hyden. Um, those two guys are my JV and sophomore coaches um so it's just been a blessing that the coaching tree that we've had is now kind of expanded out and um you know rex the head coach at jefferson which makes it easy to network and and pick brains and so Mm -hmm. it's just a really healthy community and i'm so lucky and i wouldn't be here if i weren't able to make those phone calls and pick the brains of people that are much smarter than i am so yeah and i gotta ask um what i i I guess hopefully this doesn't uh surprise you but what is the current win-loss record to coach nelson well, well, right now, as it stands, um, Sioux Falls, Washington is up two nothing. Okay, so we're up two nothing. But I mean, there's a lot of we and and granted, these last couple of years, I mean, it's been we we've been blessed with a lot of a lot of good players, and so um, it, it's been it was a very smooth transition for myself coming into a spot that was um, well taken care of, and and yep. and obviously run really well by him and the staff that we had and um, full of, full of players that knew how, how to win at the varsity level. And, 
And so I'm, I'm, I say it with that, that we're up to nothing with a grain of salt, knowing that, Hey, there's a lot of games left to be played. So yeah. I'll take it while I have it. That's for yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, and I mean, to not downplay this as much as you are, uh, coach Nelson's team have, they have been very solid the past couple of years as well. And so kudos to you as well, because people can come in and just destroy a program as well as uh, maintain it. And so, yeah, I, I just was really curious what the, the current uh, win loss record at the moment was. So that's, that's kind of fun to hear. And I hope that uh rivalry keeps going there. I'm sure um, it will. <laughs> now, now tell me a fun story about um, your, your coaching experience. It can be, you know, at your volunteer, at your JV, um, you know, or at your head coaching position. Um, yeah, just give me a fun story or two about your current coaching experiences. Well, you know, I, I, one comes to mind and, and I've told, I've told coach Rec this story and, and obviously he, he in this situation was when we played Jefferson two years ago, my first year. And, you know, the, I feel like the first year for sure, but even last year in these, I, I just feel like maybe it will never end that you kind of, your head is spinning at certain points in the year when, you're just trying to keep things afloat or you're trying to think like, where's our team at right now? Are we, are we in a good place or what do we need to be doing? And so two years ago um, we had a double, we had, we played Friday, Saturday, we played Friday night at Roosevelt. We played Saturday early afternoon at Jefferson. So obviously two years ago was when Roosevelt went undefeated and they were absolutely yep. phenomenal. And so we went over there on Friday night and hung around for a quarter and a half, even even the halftime, I think we were down maybe eight, but we felt pretty good about it. And then the second half, we just got run out of the gym. I think we ended up losing by about 25. Just they were really, really good, and we just didn't have an answer. So, um, you know, go home Friday night and, you know, try to say we got to bounce back tomorrow against a really good Jefferson team. And so we show up on Saturday to Jefferson and um, – we're kind of prepping for the game. We're doing our normal routines and everything like that. And our our routine typically is that we go in and we meet as a team at the end of the third quarter of the game prior to varsity. So we have kind of our – so guys usually at halftime of that game before they go in and start getting dressed, start kind of going through their pregame stuff. Well, at the time, uh, you know, guys are going in and the third quarter is happening and – we get toward the end of the third quarter and I look over in the stands and our point guard, McKelly Caballo is still sitting there in the stands in his sweatpants and stuff, not even going and getting ready. So I look at, I look at Mike Holstein, our JV coach, and I'm just like, Oh my goodness, what's M what's MK doing? Does he know that we we're, we're going to meet as a team in like 45 seconds. So we go in, we meet, you know, he comes in, he's kind of getting ready at his own pace and I can just kind of tell we're not there. And another player in okay, Cod, he's, he's kind of walking through the halls of Jefferson there down by the training room and he doesn't have a Jersey on and he's kind of just doing his own thing. Well, then game ends, we come out to, to take the floor for warmups and two of our guys aren't even ready yet for warmups. Um, they're late getting out there. I look at coach Holstein. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. We're going to get beat by 20. Like this isn't going to be good. And so even, you know, we kind of go down, to, to mid court, I look at Tim and I'm like, Tim, I, I don't think this is going to be good on our end today. Like that we're not ready like this. I can just tell right now, last night's taking its toll. And Tim looks at me, he's like, yeah, right. Whatever. Like, you know, doesn't believe me. And so game happens. Well, long story short, in the end, um, McKelly Kambalo ends up going for 27 <laughs> and just, just has, has a day and just looks like he's sleepwalking through it. And it was just one of those funny coaching experience because Tim has been coaching long enough to know that kids operate a whole lot differently than we coaches think they're operating. And when they're ready, it doesn't, it may not look like it. And sometimes we think they're ready and they're not ready at all. Yep. And it was a wake up call for me where it was just like, man, do I, do I really know anything? You know, why am I stressing? You know, kids are kids. And when they're ready to play, when you roll the ball out and the lights come on, it doesn't take much for them to turn it on. So that was kind of yeah. a funny story that popped into my head. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy that um, – and I even think about my high school time where you had this routine. You're like, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. You got to be ready at this point. And, and like you mentioned, like you have people that come out like they're ready to go and just, you know, it, it turns to be a flop or they just aren't ready to play at all. And it's 
And some of those people, like you mentioned in your, in your own story where they come out and they're just like, here we go. We're just whatever. And <laughs> they're just like the most even keel. Like we're just going to go like this throughout the game, just be steady Eddie, you know? Yeah. But, um, and then following up with that, do you have a fun or memorable interaction with a coach or sorry, with an official? Um, I, I think I've only ever had you one time and that was this past year in the state tournament. So I don't, I don't think I've had you prior to that, but um, any other memorable interactions with an official? Well, I mean, the most, the funniest memorable experience thus far actually happened in our last game of this last season. So okay. we, we were playing for eighth place and you know, anybody who's played in that game knows that that's just the game where you kind of, you let it all hang out and you, you, you get guys in, get them in their opportunity to play in state tournament. And so yep. we had a sophomore that came in and he, he never wastes any time getting shots up. Like it's, it's going to get up in the first time it hits its hands, going to get it up. And he has a really quick release. And so, um, you know, official standing next to me during a free throw, after this player had just shot his first shot and he looks at me and he says, man, that kid gets it off quick. You got to get him the ball again. Well, next time down, he gets the ball and he lets it fly right away. And so I, I uh, dead ball comes, he comes and stands by me again. And he's like, man, I'm going to call that kid slinger. Cause he just slings it right away. And I was like, yeah, it, it doesn't take long to get it off. And so I think a couple possessions go by and then finally on the opposite end, he, he gets a um, a shot from the corner and he gets it off again. So I mean, this is this all happens with this within a span of like a minute and a half, minute forty. He's already gotten up at least three shots and maybe gotten fouled on another one. And <laughs> when he shoots that corner three, um, same ref is across the way from me and and he kind of gives me a side eye with a high eyebrow look, like wow, he got it off again. Like how many is this guy going to get off? <laughs> you know, because I told him like he's going to get shots off. Yeah, and so it was just a it was a it was a fun way to end a, um, you know, call it disappointing state sure. tournament or or whatever you want to call it, but um, that was a that was a funny interaction with with him and and just in a fun environment, you know, and and playing basketball and it, it was just it was a um, one that stands out to me for sure. Yeah, that's that's good, and I I would I could probably guess uh, who the official was if I, if I remember, but I. My brain slipped me at the moment, but I, I I could probably guess which one it was. Um, I, I'm trying to remember too. I can't remember <laughs> for sure. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, um, following up with that, uh, with officials, uh, it's our it's our job to you know call the rules and call them as they are written. And so, what are you you've been around ten years now, and then if you count you know your college years and everything like that, it's probably closer to I don't know what fifteen, sixteen, maybe even more than that. Um, years of being around basketball and especially in the state of South Dakota, what's uh first first half is what's a rule that you are glad that was added to uh basketball at the high school level. And then on the flip side, uh, what's one that you don't like or wish was maybe modified or altered slightly? Well, um, I guess we'll see how this whole um, bonus after five fouls goes, you know, that's going to yeah. be, that's going to be interesting. That just, um, I can't, I, we got to do a podcast the, a year from now to kind of give an update <laughs> how, on how that, I don't, we'll see how that feeling is. I, I think that that'll be interesting for the game of basketball or for high school level. And we'll see how teams kind of use it to their advantage um, or teams change because of it. But um, I would say a rule that I uh, like is simply that we all, we have the shot clock. Like I, yeah. I remember playing back, you know, when I, when I played high school basketball, there was no shot clock. And I think it's really, um, I think it's really beneficial for just the, the enjoyment of the game, the pace mm -hmm. of the play. I think kids enjoy it. I think that having, having that there is just uh, um, kind of a no brainer. So, I mean, yeah. places that don't have it at the high school level states that don't have it yet. Um, I just, I, can't fathom that and i think that would be really difficult as a coach to adjust to yeah um, did so, did a did langford have an issue with uh getting shots up quickly back in the day we did not no <laughs> we, we we could get shots up uh plenty plenty fast um but i mean we played against teams you know and and uh you know we so my um junior year we actually lost to white river and, and louis krogman in the, okay. in the championship and so yeah uh, our, our goal was to try to slow them down yep. the best we could. So we, 
we tried to do somewhat of a stall technique, but they were just too good and they could get the ball from us whenever they wanted. So, sure. um, but no, we, we didn't have trouble getting shots up typically, but, um, so that would be my, my favorite thing that's been implemented, you know, since I can remember and, and having that shot clock available, a rule that I, what was the second part A rule that I wish could be changed or modified? Yeah. Or you just, you're like, I don't like this rule at all. Any, any of the following. Man, that's a tough one. Um, you know, one other, sorry, one other thing I do, I do really like is us kind of going to the, um, the mercy, the 30 points. Yeah. You know, I think that that too is, um, just, a just, just a good, a good, a good benefit that we have just to speed along games and, and, and also just, I don't know, certain games just need to, um, have that rule implemented. So I think that's a good, a good one yeah. too. Um, let's see rules that should be modified or gotten rid of. Gosh, I have a tough time with this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not one like to think in terms of that. We need to get rid of any, um, modifying wise. I think there's just always so many challenging calls that, um, need to be made with like footwork and finishing now yeah. around the rim because of how kids view NBA players doing it or thinking yeah. that it translates. Yep. Uh, so I don't, I know this isn't going to answer your question, but I, I, I totally agree with what you said. And an official's rule is to call it as it is, you know, yep. as, as they see it. And so um, I think that maybe one area to be modified or is, is just, the, the 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 black and white how we're gonna call um you know steps and and call you know travels or, or what have yeah. you as as the euro step continues to graduate into two and a half three four steps <laughs> it seems like you know just things like that um i think that there's always so much gray area around what's seen what you know like a um a slow euro that actually is two steps but like we tell our guys like it looks like a travel you know yeah. Even, even though it's maybe not like it's just not, it, it looks like a travel because it's a slow two footed Euro. Yeah. And so I think that um, maybe something could be shifted with the, the footwork, the finishing aspect of, of the rule. But for the most part, honestly, I, I think it's where, where we're at right now is a really good place. And I think games are called um, really well for the most part. And I, mm -hmm. that's why I'm not one to, you know, be, yelling, screaming too much because I know how tough of a job it is and how we're not going to catch everything. Um, you know, try to do our best with, you know, the physical aspect of having two hands on and not letting, you know, players keep them on. And I know that's always tough too. Yep. Um, but I guess that's, that would be my long winded answer that probably doesn't sure. even answer the question. So I guess I'll follow up with this then. Uh, your thoughts on when NFHS is like a spin move is basically a travel. Is that kind of where that's stemming from as well? Yes. Yes, okay. exactly. You know, and I know there's so much gray area around like what the spin move looks like and, and how they, you know, they throw around the term like the ball oscillating or when it actually, you know, is, is in possession of the, the player and stuff. But um, yeah, I just think that it's easy to like put it in a, a rule book, but then on the court, like it doesn't, it doesn't look that way or it does. So then yep. what, what's it, what is it actually in the real game? Yep. You know, Cor correct. And, and I've had, I've had a, a few conversations on Facebook with people I know who are parents of kids and not, none that I've officiated, thank God, but like, <laughs> you know, they're like, how is this a travel? And then like, when I, I like for one parent specifically, I like sent him direct message. I said, this is how we're supposed to adjudicate it and why. And I did a breakdown like each frame by frame of why is it travel according to NFHS. And so it's one of those where I have a hard time calling it. But at the same time, if the state says, hey, we're calling this, then it's like, well, I got to call this or else I'm going to be in, in the doghouse here. So I, I completely understand. I, I do college men as well. And so I really like theirs where it's like, if you think it's legal, it's probably legal, <laughs> you know, or yeah. if you think, if you don't know if it's legal or illegal side on the side of legal. And mm -hmm. so I, I kind of like that because they actually put that in the rule book for the men's side like a year ago. Okay. And so I, I like that where it's like, if you don't really know, 
basically the old mantra, if you don't know, don't blow. That's kind of what they kind of went towards in the men's basketball realm is let's, let's just assume that this is a legal move because it's, if it's smooth enough and it looks well, but I mean, if it's just awful and it's really slow and, and, you know, just not good, then, yeah. then, you know, I, I feel like people can be like, Whoa, that was definitely a travel, you know? Yeah. But exactly. then there's, then there's times where it's like, Whoa, that's definitely a travel. And you're like, no, that's, you know, so it's, you can't always please people, but yeah, I understand, really. I understand the sentiment behind what you're saying of like, Hey, this thing is a, a nice smooth move and we're going to the hoop. We're about to score. And now you're blowing it off because you have to call it travel this year. So yeah. I, I, I completely understand that. And it, and it's hard to, and, and again, I totally, I understand why it has to be, um, you know, called exactly how NH, um, NFHS has it. it, but you know, like kids, they, they, they play and get away with a certain amount of stuff during the summer. Yep. yep. So then they can't understand why it doesn't get allowed during season. And, and so it's like, well, that, that I feel like that's the hard part of like, well, let's find balance so that there's not confusion, which, you know, then it's our job to teach. And I, I really appreciate you guys. Sometimes I, I, I ask you, Hey, can you go over to so-and-so and, and tell them why? Yeah. Because they just, they don't, they don't want to hear it from us necessarily. Yeah. Yep. Like, well, coach doesn't know anything. I, I want you to hear it from the person who can explain it exactly by the yep. rule. Yeah. Um, but we know in, in the summertime that summer ref's not going to have a good answer or a good explanation or, sure. you know, typically. So yep. that, that, that consistency is hard too, because you just don't, and we see it every, every fall in open gyms, yep. you know, we see the bad habits that creep back in because they've gotten away with doing this move all summer. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, that's spin move where you drug your foot, a foot and a half. That yeah. that's going to be all the travel. You can't yep. do that in a month. Yeah. So. Uh, last question, kind of sporadic question here is, but what is what is some advice you would give to a, a newer official, um, whether they're newer to the AA realm or they're just newer in general? What's a what's some uh, uh, some pointers you would give to them from a coaching perspective? Yeah, I guess, you know, being a new coach myself, um, what I've tried to do and and like I said, just in my personality and my coaching I'm a pretty even keeled. Like I don't, I don't get riled up um, too often. And if I do, it must be something that you know, I'm get, is riling me up. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I try to really, I, I never want to act like I know more than anybody. Like I don't want to act like I, um, I have all the answers, but I want to act like I, I know enough to, you know, have a conversation. And so what I try to do is I try to have conversations with referees and not, you know, say, you know, what are you seeing or, or like, you know, in, in a, in a manner that's um, not productive. Like I want to get answers myself is like, what, what did you see that I'm not seeing? Yep. So I think the same is true, you know, for a new referee coming in, just like myself as a new head coach, like, you know, be in it to understand and, and, you know, obviously call the game as, as you think it should be called and how you, how you believe those calls need to be made, but also, you know, like when a coach has something, um, you know, also try to understand through the conversational eyes that they want to have. And then, you know, if, if you don't see eye to eye with something, it always, you know, it's, it's always about professionalism and how to model it for the, the, the kids that are on the bench or the kids that are on the floor. And so I would just say, have those conversations and, and really just try to build relationships. Like I've tried to build good relationships and good rapport with fellow coaches yeah. and same with referees, because at the end of the day, we're all in this for the players yeah. and we want, we want to model exactly what we want them to do by what we do. Yep. And so um, I think that um, luckily a majority, vast majority does a really good job of that. And so I, I would say have conversations and be a good model. Um, and, and at the end of the day, make it a good experience for these kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, you know, my goal specifically as an official is how can I make the game a- as uh, fun, as exciting, as enjoyable for the kids, the student athletes, as well as the coaches. Cause if I'm out there and I'm just causing a bunch of havoc for everybody and, you know, just making it crazy out there. It's not going to be really fun for anybody except for maybe someone with a, with an Instagram and they're just trying to, you know, get some views. Yeah. <laughs> but besides that, it, it won't be any fun for me. And I don't know why I should be in it after that. Um, right. But anyway, thanks again, Jeff. Uh, any last words for anybody out there you want to say? 
No, I would just say, you know, to you, I appreciate you doing this. I think it's a really cool idea you have. And I think um, it's so easy now to, for people to have a skewed view of like a, a referee coach relationship or a partnership in this whole thing. But, yeah. um, you know, I just want to say on my end, like, I appreciate you guys so much what you do because you you have you've got such you know you've got a job where it's lose lose i mean yeah every game you show up to it's it's you know some you're not you're not going to make somebody happy and um but you know we are really lucky that we've got officials that care about kids and and do the best job they can and and i think this is a great way to kind of show that you know we're all people trying to do the best job we can by kids and make yep. like you said make the game enjoyable and and i appreciate that you do that Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate your time. Uh, Everybody, this has been the Irenic Ref Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Gross, and we will see you next time.